Hi, everyone. It's Denise Brown from the Caregiving Years Training Academy. Thank you so much for joining me for our Caregiving Book Club. It's a conversation with authors who have written books around caregiving. So we kind of meld our love of writing and our caregiving experience and talk about what it's like. So joining me today is Bobby Carducci. Hi, Bobby. Hello, Denise. Thank you for having me on here. Yeah, it's great to see you. So Bobby, you co-host a podcast with your husband called Roger That. And you are also the author of two books and your books are Confessions of an Imperfect Caregiver and Caregiver, You Are Not Alone. So I'm grateful to have you join me today. Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> so tell me how you, how you think of yourself in terms of being a writer. Well, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been a writer since I was eight years old. When my best friend's mother got tired of us running through the house on a rainy summer morning and said, the two of you sit down, be quiet. Here's a piece of paper and a pencil, write something. And I thought, I don't know how to do that. But you know, what seemed like a very long time, the story started coming and I wrote it. And when it was time to go home, she handed it to me and she said, Bobby, this is really good. You should continue writing. And I like to joke, you know, being a good Catholic girl, I obeyed and I'm still doing it. <laughs> so, you know, for years it was very bad poetry, which I don't do anymore um, because I know it's very bad poetry, but I started with short stories and um, then I moved on to a little bit longer stories. And then when my father-in-law, Roger, came to live with us, um, it, after having, you know, raised four kids and working full time, I was at home more and I thought, um, let me see if anybody would be willing to buy anything that I wrote. So I, I made a, a goal. At least once a month for a year, I would submit something somewhere. And I did that. Uh, Could I ahead. ask a clarifying question? Sure. So, you, so tell me what you mean by submitting something somewhere. Well, there's usually a writing contest or magazines. There's all kinds of uh, calls for submissions or opportunities for writers to um, look online now more than there was then to see what's available. I, and so once a month, I would either enter a contest or I would submit an article or a short story to some publication, either online or in print. Um, in many months, I did more than one. Uh, two months into it, I sold my first story to True Story magazine. Uh, <laughs> and tell me at this time, what type of writing was this? Um, I, I was writing fiction. I was writing short stories. Um, I was often surprised about where my brain took me. Uh, <laughs> got a lot of surprises to the point where my husband would say, where, what, where is my wife and what, what have you done with her? Um, <laughs> so, you know, that kind of encouraged me to keep going. And then when I left my corporate job to care for my father-in-law, Roger, I would hear from people in the caregiving world. And this was back in 2002. Say, why doesn't somebody write a book that tells what it's really like? And I thought, well, I can do that. I, I know how to write. Uh, I'm living this right now. I'm going to write our story. And I started writing it while I was a caregiver for him. And then of course his care took over and I had to set it aside. And um, then after he passed, I started writing it again and it was too raw. All of that experience was coming back and overwhelming me again. So I set it aside and worked on other things until finally one day came and I said, I'm going to finish this. I'm going to write this um, and told my husband, you're going to have to put up with all of the emotion that's coming with it. But this is a, this is a book that I, I have to write it. Um, and so I did. And I, I'm usually not good at writing titles, but the overwhelming feeling through the process that I wasn't doing it well enough resulted in confessions of an imperfect caregiver. And it wasn't until well into actually putting the words on paper that I realized you don't have to be perfect to do it. 
Uh, and in fact, nobody expects you to. And there's a lesson here for me that I needed to hear that would resonate with other caregivers. And that's where that book came from. So I'm curious about how you reconciled sharing such a personal experience with putting it out into the public sphere. Um, there was a lot of angst involved with that. Um, I've, I've had a comment that, you know, once you've read it, you really get to know Bobby and Mike and Roger. Um, and one of the questions I often get is, what about other people in the family? Did, were you concerned that they would be upset? And I knew some of them would be, um, but everything in that book is true. And I didn't skewer anybody. I just put out what happened. And I wrote it in such a way that it reads like a novel. So um, I said to my husband, Mike, one day I said, you know, there were moments in there where neither one of us looked like kind, caring people. Um, in fact, the exact opposite. Is it okay if I share when you acted like a jerk? And he said, absolutely. If you're gonna put it out there, it has to be true. Um, and so, you know, it is not only a story of caregiving, it's a story of a, of a husband and wife whose marriage is being challenged in a way that it's never been challenged before. And, and Mike and I really like each other in addition to really loving each other, but we fought more during those years than we ever had before or since. And I think it's important in the book to show that you can, you can live through that and still like each other at the end. Yeah, I think what's interesting about writing is that it helps the writer and the reader. Absolutely. So you, you process the experience through the experience of writing and then the reader really benefits from that processing. And I also think that in order for writing to be powerful, it has to be truthful. And that is actually one of the biggest challenges of being a writer is figuring out how do I share the truth? It's one of the things I tell my students and I do teach writing and I lead a couple of uh, writers groups. If you don't cry when you write it, they won't cry when they read it. And there's a lot of tears on the pages of that book, I have to tell you. What did you learn from writing your first book that helped you when you were writing your second book? Um, they're actually very different books, but there's, there's a number of similarities in there that both deal with family members dealing with dementia and people with dementia, because that's, that's what my experience was. My father-in-law had dementia. He had Lewy body dementia. Um, and it's so difficult for caregivers who are new to it, and even some that are a bit further down the road to understand dementia behaviors and how our response to them can either escalate or de-escalate the situation. So I, I had been writing a blog, the Imperfect Caregiver blog for a while and sharing our experiences and writing about um, people who were in the caregiving world and how they responded to this. And so often caregivers feel isolated and alone. And I wanted to let them know that there are many, many, many of us who understand and, and who live it with them and we're there as a resource for them. So Caregiver, You, you Are Not Alone came about when a publisher that I knew said, have you ever considered some of taking some of your blog posts and turning them into a book? And I thought, oh, okay, I can just send her all of these files and she can very nicely pull them together and, and, and I'll have a book. And um, she had said, well, that's not what I had in mind. I would like you to, to turn them into a story. Well, that wasn't possible because they were many different stories. It wasn't just one person's story. So what we did is we took the, a blog post and 
addressed the situation that was being discussed in there and created a story around it where then I responded to what that issue was. Say for instance, if somebody want, loved one insisted on going home, we would write, I would write the story of a caregiver dealing with someone who wanted to go home and moving them from um, confronting them and insisting that they're home to finding a way for them to feel at home. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really proud of both of those books because they address this situation in, in unique ways. And the, the longer book, many caregivers don't have time to sit down and read a novel sized book. But in Caregiver, You Are Not Alone, there's short stories with commentary at the end that they can sit down and you know just take a few minutes here and there. So I have both ways of trying to, trying to help people. The more ways that I can reach out to caregivers, the more I feel like I'm fulfilling what my purpose is. I think of writing as an art form, obviously, but I also feel like it's an art form that requires constant attention, that it, it is a practice, it is a habit. So what's your writing habit? Oh boy, um, a lot of writers aren't going to agree with me. I you know I hear all kinds of writing advice. Some, so many people insist, you know, you must sit down and you must write every single day. Um, I am a big believer of writing when it's so important to you to get those words on the paper, that's when you sit down and do it. Because there's a lot involved in writing that is not actually typing out words. Uh, it's reading, it's thinking, it's ab absorbing yourself in, in the process. There are, there are many times when I'm working on a piece, whether it's working on the next book or writing an article for a magazine or a, a blog post where right in the middle, I lose my inspiration. How do I pull this? How do I get this where I want it to be? And some of us will have tricks and you know, some people will say, well, just put that aside and sit down and write anything and everything. What I find works for me is a little strange. I go and take a shower because there's something about hot water on my head that inspires my brain to start working again. And that will usually get me back in the chair. But I don't write every single day. I use some of the other processes like talking with other writers and, and being part of a writer's group. And uh, we help each other in so many ways. I find writers are probably one of the most generous people. They don't feel like they're competing with one another because the more good writing that's out there, the more people will read and more people will read, the more that there are markets and opportunities for us to get our, to get our words out. So it's a very inclusive supporting group of people, yourself included. I mean, you're a prime example. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about your writer's group. How well, do you meet and what's it like? I have one group. It's called the Round Hill Writer's Group because I live in Round Hill, Virginia, that I have had meeting at the local library for 19 years. And I am very proud to say that every single year, someone in that group publishes for the first time because we come together to share resources and to encourage one another. And every, we have everything in there from people who are just beginning to think about writing to people who have been writing for years, to publishers, to editors. Some people are good at sending out query letters and we help people do that. Um, and then I have a group that I've had for six years at the local senior center. And this group of people are, they're, they're not writers, but they have stories to tell. When, when I was invited to come in and uh, lead that group, I knew that anybody old enough to be at the senior center had stories to tell and they were important stories to tell. So um, I go in <clears throat> and it doesn't matter if they wanna be published or not. A lot of them are writing family histories for their, for their children and their grandchildren, which is so important. 
I'm astonished at how many times somebody will come into the group and say, well, I, I don't know if this is any good. And I said, share when you feel comfortable. Nobody's compelled to share, but when you feel comfortable, you start sharing and every single time something wonderful comes out. And so I've had that group for six years now, just this last month, two of them have gotten stories uh, accepted by Chicken Soup for the Soul. Mm. And then on top of that, for almost as long as I've had the uh, Round Hill group, I've been a member of a Pennsylvania based writers group that has members all across the United States. And that's called Pen Writers, P-E-N-N, -N, because it's based in Pennsylvania. And I attribute them with my writing success because they have been going to their workshops and going to their conferences and becoming friends with authors and editors and publishers. Um, I can bring those resources back to the other two groups. And I went from aspiring writer to one of their keynote speakers to several years on the board of directors. And again, everybody in there is to support everybody else. Um, so that kind of keeps me busy. And fortunately now with COVID, we can do all of this via Zoom. So all three groups are, are thriving uh, and, and I'm so pleased with that. I love the idea of a writer's group. For our listeners and our viewers who are thinking, I think that sounds great, but I don't know if I'm qualified enough to join. What words of encouragement would you offer them to think about finding a writer's group and connecting with one? Um, if you're thinking about writing, you're qualified to join. The only thing that I would say disqualifies somebody from a writer's group, and even then I would encourage them to try, is somebody who says, I've never read a book. I don't read, I don't like to read. Um, because I think reading, especially from an early age on like, like I did and so many people did, wires your brain to how sentence structure should be and, and how to create a scene and those type of things. We've only had one or two people come into the group who felt that way. Um, and one, we were able to encourage, you know, if you read and you think about what it is in those words that resonated with you, that's, that will teach you how to get what you want onto the paper. And the other person just walked away because they felt that they should just put anything on the paper that they wanted to, and we would fix it. Well, we don't do that. We, we never tell somebody your writing is terrible and you shouldn't be here. But we do point out, would you consider maybe phrasing it this way and take a look at this and um, what books do you like or what articles do you like? Because frankly, you don't have to write book length, especially now in this age with everything that's available online. <clears throat> Regardless of the subject, there's an e-magazine or a blog or an article waiting for a submission from someone who writes what you love. What's the goal of being a part of a writer's group? I think it, it's, it's to help us through the hard times when those rejections come. You know, I, I mentioned that I was submitting one, at least once a month for a year. And, you know, I made, I got that first sale and a couple of months later I got the second sale and I was walking around thinking, oh, look at me. I should have been writing all along. I am so good at this. And then the rejection started coming in. And because I had been submitting for so long, I would get one a week and sometimes two. And I was walking around the house and <clears throat> thinking, they, those two publishers must have been really desperate to take something from me because I'm really bad at this and, and, and I'm just a big fat loser. And my husband and Denise, you know him and his sense of humor, he looked at me and he said, but honey, you're not fat. 
<laughs> <laughs> and I and and I laughed and I we laugh every time I share that story, but it got me out of that self doubt that is so prominent in writers because you're putting yourself out there, you're putting your babies out there, and also in caregivers when you think you know I'm not I'm not doing this right. Somebody doesn't like me. What I'm doing is wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, so I think that you kind of you know, pluses and minuses in both of these things that I'm involved in are made stronger because of the sensitivity of, of what's there. But that's what artists do. And eventually you learn when you want, if you're looking to publish, that rejection is part of it and it usually has nothing to do with the quality of your work. It has to do with what they need on that particular day. And it might be absolutely stunning. And we all know very established, powerful, popular writers who went through years of rejection. Um, so knowing that doesn't take the sting out, but having a group of supportive people around you who say, oh, okay, the rejection comes in. What that means is file the rejection, send it out again. I love the encouragement to keep going. It's this idea that we can we can keep going because we can just say, oh, the rejection is a fact. It's not a reflection. It's not right. a stop sign. It is just the reality of the industry and the situation. Absolutely. For me, I love to write because I love words. I am fascinated by definitions of words and how there are different meanings to a single word and I like to play on words and I like to build words into a sentence and then I like to build sentences into a paragraph. So for me it's around the structure starting with a word. What is it about writing that you love? You know that that's interesting. Um, well I love the fact that it <coughs> it takes me out of my own head. You know, a lot of times when things were really difficult, I could go and I could go into another world with writing. But one of the things that I did is I started, as I started, sounds similar to what you do. And one of the things I teach is every part of what you write needs to have a beginning, middle, and end. Every sentence, every paragraph, every page, every completed article, and how you construct that. Is, is key to creating something that will resonate with readers. And so I would go through, and I still do at times, and look at how those sentences are put together and um, how those paragraphs lead me on to the next one. Uh, and and it, it looks like it's so easy, which gives people the idea that writers just sit down and, and start typing and get to the end and, and, and you're done. But we know that's not true. <laughs> that's when you have to go back and you have to keep going back and fixing and, and, and editing and improving. But what I loved, especially about short stories was I would start it and my storytelling ability would kick in. And then these, this surprise ending would reveal itself. It somehow referred back to the beginning and I had no idea when I started that that's what was going to happen. That fascinates me. Yeah, the mystery of how the story will unfold is as, as exciting for the writer as it is for the reader. Absolutely. I just, you know, I, I, I'm working on another book now. And I, I was sharing with the writers groups. A new character walked in. I had no idea she was coming. And I really like her. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. And I think it, it, what's so fascinating about writing is that it starts with a word. Mm -hmm. And then it's a second word, third word, with their word, third word. I just find that fascinating, what's created from a word. Yeah, I, I'm reading a series of books right now um, about m magic and magical creatures. And, you know, the shapeshifters and I, I found myself saying, 
how, how did this all come together? How could, how did you create the character that is extremely human and turns into a wolf? And over here you have a human that, that turns into a dragon and, and you bring these, <clears throat> these characters together in a way that creates an astounding ministry and they each have their own voices and, and, and you know who they are. I am just in awe of somebody that can do that kind of world building. Yeah. I think the other part that you talked about this community of writers is that we all appreciate someone who writes well. Mm -hmm. We all love someone who writes well. We just really appreciate the craft which is why we read, right? Because we just love to read what someone else can create because we're just in awe of their perspective on storytelling and crafting the sentences and the ability to pick and find a story and tell it in such a compelling way. Absolutely. And I start every day reading and I end every day reading. And then because of the writers groups and because of writing in the caregiving community, my whole day, every day, it somehow revolves around the written word. Yeah, it's awesome. Now, it, it, in today's world, we hear that people don't understand that people don't read anymore. Well, people read more now than they ever did. They just read in different forms. And I'd love to share my thoughts on the fact that there have always been storytellers and there always will be storytellers, whether it's cave painting or, or scrolls or books, or e-readers, there will always be storytellers. And so writers are so important to our community and to our world. Absolutely. And on that, we're gonna close. So Bobby, for our listeners and our viewers, tell us what your website address is. Oh, that's simple. It's bobbycarducci.com. Okay. <laughs> and your two books are? Confessions of an Imperfect Caregiver and Caregiver, You Are Not Alone. And I look forward to the release of your third book. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Bobby. Always great to see and connect with you. You too. And I just want to mention that we have great resources for libraries. If you are interested in adding a caregiving resource section on your website, we have book recommendations and we have links to our podcast. So we help you start to add a caregiving resource section in your library. You can go to careyearsacademy.com slash library to connect to all the resources, including a monthly newsletter. Thanks everybody so much for watching and listening. I'm Denise Brown. Take care. Bye-bye.